We welcome those of you who are watching by YouTube. Well, hopefully watching by YouTube. So let's begin our worship. I invite you to stand as you are able for our time of confession and forgiveness. Holy Trinity, one God, whose steadfast love is everlasting, whose faithfulness endures from generation to generation. Amen. Trusting in the mercy of God, let us confess our sins. Reconciling God, we confess that we do not trust your abundance and we deny your presence in our lives. We place our hope in ourselves and rely on our own efforts. We fail to believe that you provide enough for all. We abuse your good creation for our own benefit. We fear difference and do not welcome others as you have welcomed us. We sin in thought, word, and deed. By your grace, forgive us. Through your love, renew us. And in your spirit, lead us, so that we may live and serve you in newness of life. Amen. Beloved of God, by the radical abundance of divine mercy, we have peace with God through Christ Jesus, through whom we have obtained grace upon grace. Our sins are forgiven. Let us live now in hope, for hope does not disappoint, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. O oh God, with all your faithful followers of every age, we praise you, the rock of our life. Be our strong foundation and form us into the body of your Son, that we may gladly minister to all the world through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Yeah. Okay. So um, we've been trying to do something for our children every worship service online the last few weeks. So our thought today uh, is we have, well, we have a bunch of children here actually. I know some of you quite well. And uh, one of them sitting right over here on the right-hand side. I won't point any names out, but his initials, his initials start with Larry. So, <clears throat> can I put you on the spot? Sure. Okay. You know this lady sitting beside you, I hope, because you're really close there. Not his wife. A day or two. Okay, you know at least a day or two. That's close enough then. So, what would you say is one of her gifts? She's sweet and lovable. Good answer, yeah. You get to go home today. So Larry has just told us that his wife is gifted with sweetness and lovability. That is a gift, I think. Some of us can be loved, but we may not be all that lovable. All right? All right, I'm going to put somebody else. Anybody else want to be get put on the spot? Okay. All right, then... then Bradley, there's a lady sitting back here in the blue. Does she have a gift? Yes, she does. Can you share one of them with us? Yes, I can. Would you? You're going to make me beg for her. She's a good Christian woman who serves others. Serving. So Bradley has just told us that Tony's, one of Tony's gifts is serving others. There's a lot of people who help but we don't have necessarily a servant's heart. So I might be able to smile a lot. I might be able to give my mom or dad a hug, but it may not make me lovable, right? Tony might do stuff for other people, 
but it doesn't mean necessarily she has the gift of serving. And so those who have the gift of serving can see ways that they serve, see the opportunities in advance, so to speak. So in a text from Romans that is in our it's in the lessons for today, but it's not in the bulletin. Paul talks in the letter in his letter to the Romans about the gifts that people have that are needed in the church. And some people have this gift, and some people have another gift, and some people have another kind of gift. And when we add them all up together, they make a beautiful thing. It's like a rainbow. Sometimes you can see a rainbow in the sky, and you might only can make out two or three of the colors, but when it all works together, and all of the colored gifts are there, all of those colors make up a whole rainbow. And it glistens, and it provides beauty. And so I encourage us today to think about the gifts that we have. And I also encourage us to think about the gifts that other people have. And when you see it in them, say so. So for you folks at home, if you see something happening today and you see your neighbor out in the yard planting flowers, and you can see in the, in the, in the yard how well it looks, let them know that you think they have the gift of giving beauty to the world. So remind one another about the gifts that we have. Amen. Let us read Psalm 138 responsibly. I will give thanks to you, O Lord, with my whole heart. Before the God, I will sing your praise. When I, when I call, you answered me. You increased my strength within me. All the rulers of the earth will praise you, O Lord, when they have heard the words of your mouth. They will sing of the ways of the Lord, that great is the glory of the Lord. The Lord is high, yet cares for the lowly, receiving the haughty from afar. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you bring me safe. You stretch forth your hand against the fury of my enemy. Your right hand shall save me. You will make good your crown for me, O Lord. Your steadfast love endures forever. Do not abandon the works of your hands. The word of the Lord. Hear now the gospel from the gospel of Matthew. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do you say that the son of man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, but others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he sternly ordered the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. The Gospel of the Lord. I wish I'd have known about the gnats when I was working on this sermon. Because this story this morning is about power. There's a lot of different kind of power in the world. There's individual power. There's 
political power, there's heavenly power. Individual power can be when uh, somebody has a lot of skills of organizing people for a particular goal, or maybe expertise in a field of knowledge of some sort, somebody who can motivate and inspire, or somebody who has vision and can help share, somebody who can identify gifts in other folks and make a group succeed. But now at the same time, individual power can also be used the other way. It can be expressed in a domineering kind of fashion. We hear a lot about bullying and we see it and experience it a lot these days. Being greedy can be a form of individual power. Some instances there are times when people just put themselves first, put their own needs above anybody else's, and that could be a type of power. Now, if you've had an opportunity to listen to any type of news or social media or read any type of newspaper or magazine, then you probably already know that we're in the midst of a political power time. If you don't know that we're in the midst of an election cycle, tell me what your secret is. So in the midst of these days there's a lot of posturing that will be going on there's going to be a lot of negative advertising that will continue it's already started it happens every time there's an election so there's a lot of this kind of political power of people wanting to have more say so about something than somebody else now our gospel lesson this morning considers a confession from peter but before we consider his words, I think we need to think a little bit about the location of where this story takes place. It'll shed some light on how people in that first century, people in Matthew's audience, how they understood and what they might have been thinking about when they heard this story. Now, this story takes place, according to Matthew and Mark as well, in a place called Caesarea Philippi. It's a city been established for hundreds of years, but when the Romans came along, they needed a place to serve as an outpost in their ever-expanding world, and they picked that space. Toward the beginning of the first century, there was a guy named Herod the Great. Herod is the one who oversaw, he was the one that the wise men came to and said, you know, you need to go that way or come back and tell me. And Herod the Great was given all this region of the Jewish, basic Jewish population and territory to be in charge of. He would take care of them and keep them under control. And Rome would give him a lot of riches and wealth and recognition and power. In about 3, 4, 5 uh, AD, Herod the Great dies. And all of his property, all of his territory of authority was divided into four. He had four sons. One of them was named Philip. The other two were, two of the other ones took the name of Herod, and Philip didn't want to do that, so he became known as Philip Tet the Tetrarch. He was about as mean and as power hungry as his father. Now, also in this area, this area has a lot of waterfalls caves, a lot of rivers running through it, and in the early, late, um, prior to the first century, my dates are getting screwed up here some, there was thought to be that this city would be the location of the mythological Greek god Pan. Pan was one of the four or five most powerful gods of the Greek mythology. Pan was king or, or god of the dead, the god of the underworld. And it was thought and believed that this location of where Pan existed and lived was also a portal to go to the underworld. And so Pan had total control over who went that way and who came back this way. And we may not think so, but in the Greek world, that was highly powerful. So in this place of power, geographical, political, spiritual power, Jesus enters into a conversation with his disciples. 
Now, it wouldn't surprise me if it's somewhere along the way before this story gets recorded, they're probably sitting around and talking about what's going on here. What, what is the, what's the stories about Caesar? What are the stories that they've heard and know about about Philip? What are the stories they know about Pan? And how does all those intermingle? And they're talking about one kind of power and another kind of power. And then maybe one of the disciples has an idea and says, hey, you know, Jesus, you know, it wasn't too long ago that you walked on the water. And then another disciple pops up and says, yeah, but you remember you healed four people? And you remember how these folks were sick and, and they're not sick anymore and how you perform these wonders and awesome things? And Jesus, you've got power. Maybe we ought to find a city and name it after you. And I can sort of see Jesus sitting around and listening to all this and gets sort of pensive maybe. He gets a little thoughtful and he reflects on this question of power. And at some point then, he comes to the disciples and he says, I got a question for you. Who do people say that I am? Well, those disciples, they had easy answers then. Well, I've heard people say you're Elijah. Come back to visit us. And other people says, well, I, I heard other people say that you're one of the prophets. And Jesus hears those responses and he contemplates them. It may even make him feel sort of good. But it gets to him after a while and he comes back to them and says, guys, I'm, I've been thinking about that and what other people say about me and I really appreciate that. I'm, I'm humbled by it. But I've been thinking about this power thing. And now I'm wondering, who do you say that I am? And now the disciples are quiet. They sort of look at each other and you know, they twiddle their thumbs and they you know, look up at the sky and they're highly distracted because maybe one or two of them have an answer, but they really don't want to say it. You know, like if you're in class and they call on you and you know, they say, well, what's, the, what's two plus two? Well, it might be four. But if I raise my hand, I'll get called on. If I say it's four and it's wrong, people will laugh at me. So they didn't want to do that. But then Simon, Simon, whose brain kicks up words and answers and comments, and before anything can happen, it goes from brain to mouth, and it's out there in the public. And Peter, there he is. Simon says, you're the Messiah, the Son of God. And Jesus doesn't deny it. He renames Simon. Simon becomes Cephas. Simon becomes the rock. The first and only time that that word is used in the Gospel of Matthew. And Peter's going to be given power. Because all of those yous that we read in that Gospel lesson today, at the end of it, it's all singular. It's all directed at Peter. Upon Peter... Jesus is going to build the church of God. Upon Peter, he will give power over the gates of Hades, the power spot of Pan. And Hades will not stand against the church that Jesus builds. And so there it is. The divine power of God being recognized and spoken in the same breath, in the same place of all the other political, geographical, and spiritual powers of the day. And we get to hear Jesus proclaim that God's church is going to be built on a rock that's empowered by the divine name of Jesus. Jesus, the Christ. The only name that truly loves. The only power that truly offers compassion and forgiveness and restoration and hope. The only name that truly extends welcome and belonging and community. So Peter, the rock, becoming the leader of the church, a follower and disciple of Christ, and the church is given power and authority to forgive and to build and to proclaim, and they do. Sometimes it goes a little sideways. Sometimes it goes a little more than sideways. There's so many examples and stories of how over the last 2,000 years, 
So much damage has been done in the name of Jesus. So many insults. So many power plays have been named, have been carried out in the name of the church. Things like the Crusades or exertion of power over women in authority. That goes back 2,000 years and 2,000 days and 2,000 hours and about 2,000 seconds. Because this is the 50th anniversary year of ordination of women in the EOCA. And our women still have more difficulty finding calls, receiving calls in the church than men do. Women of color are twice the difficulty of, of Caucasian women. And this is also the 100th anniversary year of women having the power to vote in this country. The church continues to have difficulties because we've caused injury in the name and power of the church. Whether it's women or interaction with people of color or people of different beliefs or people with different sexual identities or people where they live or how they dress. And we still do it every day. It's our difficulties. It's our challenge. It's our sinfulness. It's us wanting to be in power. Well, today... We have enough power in the church that only about 15, 10, 15% of our congregation can meet together because we don't have power over something we can't see, the COVID virus. We have congregations who split and divide and argue because of racial strife. We talk about following Jesus but when we truly follow Jesus, when we truly think about what Jesus spoke about and ministered and actions took, we can't follow Jesus without hearing him talking about the foreigner or the hungry or the poor or the children or the widow or the neighbor. He's going to ask us to do the same kind of actions. And we're going to get serious about it. But then we might find out we step on people's toes. Because they may not appreciate. It may not be their same political view. Because believe it or not, politics and Jesus cross over each other a whole lot more than we want to admit. I think we've allowed, sometimes, we've allowed in our country the, that politicians can make decisions that the church could make probably a whole lot better about how to take care of people, about how to love each other. And if we think about the struggles we're in today, a place we probably never thought we would be, a place that few of us remember anything like it, anything close. We're at the cross point of three, four, five different incredibly significant issues and struggles in our country and in our world. And we wonder who has enough power to fix it. Who has enough power to help us through it. Who has enough power to give us the courage to step outside our door and do something more than walk around the neighborhood. Because that's where a lot of people are. We're frightened. We're scared, we're confused, we're anxious, we're afraid. And who has the power to take care of all of that? I think Peter would tell us who it is. You are the Messiah, the Son of God, because God is still in the midst of it all. I think our job right now and our task from Jesus is to share God's power with a smile when we can remove the mask from a safe distance, with a smile of our eyes when we meet somebody, with a phone call, 
for the appreciation to those who work in the medical field or who heaven only knows uh, teachers and administrators and oh, college staff and bless their hearts all of our students how you guys are trying to learn I don't know how you do it you folks who are trying to help your children teach and learn I don't know how you do it I pray for God's power to be upon you on this world because we know just as Peter professed you are the Messiah the powerful son of God amen I remind you as we sing that we sing very softly.
we profess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Confident of your care and helped by the Holy Spirit, we pray for the church, the world, and all who are in need. Lord, our rock, you are our foundation in Jesus Christ, your Son, whom we confess as the living God. Prepare your church for its mission in bearing witness to Christ, both here at home and throughout the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You call forth praises from the far reaches of the universe to the smallest of creatures. Join our songs to theirs, that a spirit of praise and thanksgiving will arouse us to cherish this wondrous home you give us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. All the kings of the earth shall praise you, O Lord. Direct the leaders of countries, legislators, and magistrates, mayors, and councils to walk in your ways. Help leaders regard those in need with mercy and fulfill your loving purposes in the governance of people. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Though we walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve us, deliver us, and fulfill your purpose for us. According to your steadfast love, grant healing and wholeness to those who are bereaved, in trouble or adversity, or sick and in need of care. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You call us into our communities, in which we, though many, are one in Christ. May we recognize in ourselves and in one another the unique gifts you have given us for the building up of the church for the sake of the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You are the everlasting rock from which we were hewn, and you restore your people to joy and gladness. In blessed memory and hope, we thank you for the lives of our beloved dead. Bring us with them to our heavenly home. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In the certain hope that nothing can separate us from your love, we offer these prayers to you, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the host of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. I invite you to speak it with me. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. 
Holy, mighty, and merciful Lord, heaven and earth are full of your glory. In great love you sent to us Jesus, your Son, who reached out to heal the sick and suffering, who preached good news to the poor, and who on the cross opened his arms to all. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his death, resurrection, and ascension, we await his coming in glory. Pour out upon us the spirit of your love, O Lord, and unite the wills of all who share this heavenly food. The body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all honor, glory, now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. So as a reminder, the bread has been already cut into smaller pieces and wine has been dropped onto the bread and put inside the ramekin. All of that was done by folks with masks and gloves, so it's, it's as safe as we could get. Um, for folks watching on YouTube, I would invite you to consider if you would like to um, have communion brought to your home sometime during this week, uh, please contact the church office or myself and we will try to arrange that, that you be receiving communion, home communion from the same meal that we're providing today. Friends of Jesus come to the table. Receive nourishment for your journey. So I invite you to come one at a time or family as a group at a time. Take one ramekin uh, for yourself and take it back to your seat.
the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ given and shed for you. Let us pray. We give you thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through the healing power of this gift of life. In your mercy, strengthen us through this gift, in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord, amen. benediction and the blessing and dismissal neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus God the Creator Jesus the Christ and the Holy Spirit the Comforter bless you and keep you in eternal love Amen Go in peace, serve the Lord.